Hey, everybody. Tonight, we're going to be talking about how you can push back against manipulative tactics that some avoidantly attached people will use. I want to differentiate really hard tonight between avoidantly attached people who are ethical avoidant <laughs> and those avoidantly attached people who are more manipulative. Those are two completely different populations, ethical avoidant versus manipulative avoidant. Both of these would be classified under dismissive avoidant, by the way, for those people watching who have some knowledge of attachment theory. Uh, fearful avoidant, something completely different, what we would call disorganized attachment style. We're not going to be probably focusing on them tonight. It will be dismissive avoidant, specifically the manipulative variant of dismissive avoidant. So I know there's a tremendous number of you ethical avoidant people watching here on this channel all the time. Lots of love to you guys. Not coming at you guys tonight. So just number one, be aware of that. Manipulatively avoidant behaviors, though, we've got to learn to counter. This just as true for ethical avoidant people as it is for secure people, as it is for anxiously attached people. We've got to learn to counter these manipulative behaviors because these are some of the most harmful and hurtful people who are out there. These are the ones who give most of the avoidant people a bad name uh, for the few people who are more hurtfully, more harmfully avoidant and manipulative in those tactics. Okay. We're going to talk tonight about why they become that way, uh, what you can do to push back against those of them who are fairly reasonable. They're just using manipulation tactics sort of out of a defense, out of fear, because they don't know much better, and then what to do against those who are truly harmful and maybe are even closing in on more personality disorder territory. We will be talking about that quite a bit here tonight. Welcome, everybody in here. Good to see you. Welcome, chat. Hey, everybody over there. Good to see you. Great to have you in here tonight. Say hello if you're here. We'd love to talk with you guys over here. Uh, I will be taking questions a bit as we go on, especially from members. Keep in mind, members get priority chat. At the end of this tonight, members, at, there you are, Doza and Princess. Good to see you. Allison, good to see you as well. Welcome to my members especially. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Emma, wonderful to see you as well. Sahara, there's so many members in chat. This is so great. Thank you so much. You guys get the chat priority. If anybody else wants chat priority and answering questions, pop in, hit the join button right here, hit support the channel, join the inner circle. Whatever we can do. Hawk, good to see you. Welcome, welcome. One of my oldest members. And I mean oldest as in longest running, by the way. So thank you for being here, old man Hawk. Welcome, everybody. Tonight, how to push back against manipulation. And I want to make this very, very clear. Uh, I am not going to teach manipulation tactics in here. I think that that is immensely counterproductive. I am going to be teaching you how to build loving, authentic relationships and how to push back with healthy boundaries. This is going to be very effective. It's also very effective without manipulation. So the healthy boundaries tonight that I'm going to teach you are healthy boundaries you should be using in relationships anyway. Okay. It's going to be very, very important for not, tonight for you guys to do this. This is a lot of stuff that I teach inside my attachment circle mentorship community. You guys are probably going to recognize some of this stuff. I'm going to teach a bit out here as well in the world, but welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome. It's going to be a great topic tonight. Okay. Let's do this. Have you ever had somebody have you ever had somebody shut you down in arguments when you tell them how you feel and they say, you shouldn't feel that way? That's stupid because. That doesn't make sense because. That's not my problem because. Right? This is the dismissive part of dismissive avoidant. This is, unfortunately, more manipulative people will use these tactics and shut you down. They will stonewall you. They will argue with logic against the feelings that you're having. Those are gaslighting. Gaslighting is getting into an interesting territory. Gaslighting is doing that, but even to an element where it should be, and they know it. That is an even worse level of it, and we'll talk about that tonight. Those are good, those are good call. We're going to talk about some gaslighting anyway as well. You shouldn't feel that way. There you go, Allison. Exactly like that. You shouldn't feel that way. That's stupid. That's dumb. You're making me the bad guy. Now, sometimes there are people who do have dumb feelings. Sometimes sometimes feelings are irrational. Sometimes feelings are drawn from paranoia. Sometimes, uh, I'm not going to say you shouldn't feel that way, but sometimes things are not rational, okay? To the ethical avoidance out there who are listening right now, yes, sometimes that's the case. But by and large, Feelings are a reality that need to be dealt with. They don't go away because you say, oh, wait, here, here's how you're wrong. Poof, the feelings go away. The person experienced a pain. Pain requires some sort of a response, okay? Pain requires it. So if a person says, 
you know, I, this really hurt me. Well, that's stupid. Here's why it shouldn't have hurt you. Great. Now that we're done, go away. No, <laughs> this is pain that I felt regardless of whether you think it's okay or not. I need reassurance that this is not going to happen again, or this needs to be dealt with because it's not acceptable for you to simply say that I have to live in pain. That indicates that you don't actually care how I feel. That indicates that we don't have a relationship. So these feelings are a reality that need to be dealt with. How would you like to deal with them? I don't want to deal with them. Ah, okay. In that case, you don't want to have a relationship. Make sense? Pain requires a response. Correct. Pain requires, pain demands a response, in effect, if you want to think of it that way. Pain demands a response. How do they respond? They don't, okay? It's not that your feelings are their responsibility, but if they want to have a relationship with you, they need to care. They need to care about your pain experience. Here's the thing. The best way to push back against manipulative boundaries and or manipulative issues is with boundaries. Now, what are boundaries? Boundaries are drawn from your principles, your, your morals, your ethics, your, your whatever you want to call it, but your sense of right and wrong. They're drawn from that. And they're also drawn from your long-term goals. So if a boundary is crossed, if you are hurt, it is because one of your long-term goals has been violated in some way or because your sense of right and wrong has been violated in some way. Period. Now, you can't sweep that under the rug. They can't just say, oh, wait, here's how it's here's why it's okay that I violated your long-term goal. Wait, here's how it's okay that I violated your sense of right and wrong. That's not okay. Not acceptable. Okay? Or they top you and say whatever you did is worse than what they did. Yeah, not acceptable either. All pain demands a response. So both people can admit that both people were wrong and apologize. But, hey, this needs a response. Now, here's the thing. To maintain a sustainable relationship, both people's personal values and long-term goals must be respected and preserved. Mandatory. Not optional. Mandatory. So if you're in a relationship with someone who's driving you to violate your principles or your goals or doesn't care that those things are being violated, you are in a non-sustainable relationship. The way to push back is to say, I would love to have a sustainable relationship with you. You say that. I would love to have a sustainable relationship with you. For me to be able to do that, my sense of right and wrong and my long-term goals both have to be respected. And in this case, this was not respected. My sense of right and wrong, right, honesty, loyalty, love, compassion, whatever, or this goal that was broken. This was not, this was not respected. I need this to be respected. If you're telling me that you don't care then we are in a non-sustainable relationship. And I'm sorry, but I'm not interested in that. So I just need you to let me know, do you want to continue this relationship or not? If you do, this is my requirement. Fantastic. Somebody who cares, somebody who wants to be in a sustainable relationship with you is going to get this and say, okay, well, then we need to deal with it. What do you need from me? And then you can create measurable targets. This is why it was hurt. This is why I got hurt. This was the violation of this, this principle, or this was the violation of this goal. These are boundaries because those need to be preserved for the sustainability of the relationship. If we don't have that, those are, it seems harsh. A lot of anxious people will come out and say, this feels harsh, right? A lot of pe anxious people, when they start having boundaries, they say, I'm in my villain phase. It feels harsh and people say, well, that's an ultimatum. Aren't those bad? Ultimatums are bad when they're weaponized against you and they're not based on principles and they're not based on long-term goals. They're based on comfort or convenience. Okay. Comfort or convenience are not things that you can leverage, should leverage against other people, right? I will exploit you for comfort and convenience and I can do that because I have leverage over you. That's a bad ultimatum. This is not a sustainable relationship because it violates my sense of right and wrong and or it violates my long-term life goals. So I need this to change. Otherwise, I cannot continue in this relationship. I just need you to let me know, do you want to continue in this relationship? If so, this is the requirement. Great ultimatum. Because the, op the, the opposite of that is to say, well, I guess I don't care about my long-term goals and my sense of right and wrong. I will simply be quiet in this relationship for your convenience. And that's them giving you an ultimatum. 
or it's your parents giving you an ultimatum 30 years ago and now you're living it out again in your relationships, assuming that that's what people want from you. Here's the thing. Healthy, secure people, they want sustainable relationships. They don't want to farm you for everything they can, burn you out as fast as possible, and then move on to the next relationship. They're looking for a sustainable relationship system. So they're actually happy when you push back with boundaries about principles and boundaries about long-term goals, because it means you have those things and then you're positively predictable in a good way. And then they can measure their trust for you and see that you will push back with them and with other people. So then they can respect you. Then they can relax with you and then they can trust you. So you having boundaries is not a problem for them. They'll say, your feelings are hurt. This thing was breached. Let's get it fixed. What do we got to do to repair this relationship? Let's make it like, let's make this sustainable. Super easy. People who don't care, they will not care about sustainability. They are here to farm you for as much as they can get, then they will move on to the next one. And that's what a lot of people with anxious attachment style are used to is being farmed. And they're desperate to be farmed because it means they at least have some use to somebody and they try to put off being abandoned for as long as possible. So they violate their principles and their goals over and over and over. And that's why they don't fully connect with anybody else in, in a sustainable relationship. It's also why secure people will avoid them is because you're headed for a crash and you're used to being farmed like that. And then you don't build the proper boundaries that make you stable and sustainable. So it's really hard to maintain a stable relationship with you because then you will do 10 nice things for other people and then expect secret compensation return. That's also not sustainable. So there's the dark side of anxious right there. Much better to speak up and share it out loud and say, this is where I'm at. This is my sense of right and wrong. These are my boundaries. These are my goals. Can we respect these? Can we build a sustainable relationship? The answer is overwhelmingly yes, if they want to maintain that relationship with you. I've noticed over the ethical avoidant will try to guilt me into doing things. When I set a boundary, he actually expresses a need I could possibly meet. That And that's it. So here's the thing. Here's the thing, Emma. Exactly. The great way to push back on boundaries is to say with an ethical avoidant person, because they don't know where your boundaries are unless you tell them. That's, that's the thing. You have to let them know. Hey, you know what? I want you to do this thing. You know what? I can't do that because of this boundary, this, this principle, right or wrong, or this goal. But I want to meet your need and I want to be fair with you. Great language for an ethical avoidant person to use with them. I want to be fair with you. So can you describe the need to me? And let's find a way to meet it in a way that doesn't violate my principles or my goals. And then we can take care of each other. Sustainable. That's the key to an avoidant person's heart, by the way. An ethical avoidant person is telling them, tell me the actual need. I'll push back gently with boundaries if something is a problem, but then I will also work with you to get that need met. That's like mind blowing to them that someone would do that. I feel when I rebel is when I get his attention. Like he likes me mean almost. I'm anxiously trying to heal. Allison, that usually means that that's the only time that he takes you seriously because he has learned that your pattern is that you are going to be a doormat until you push that hard. And then he says, okay, now we'll do what you need to do. And then he steps forward. But it also may be the only time you're actually sharing measurable goals, measurable expectations and clear desires with him. So it might be that those are the only times you do that. A lot of anxiously attached people, that's that's unfortunately the toxic side of the anxious attachment piece is nice, 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 angry and resentful blowout. Nice, 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 angry, resentful blowout. And then your partner is endlessly waiting for your next blowout. That's why they typically back off and they don't trust you because they feel they fear that instability. And that itself feels unsustainable because they never want know when that explosion is going to come. It could come at the worst possible time for them when they can't handle it. And it gets exhausting for them. Not not to kick anxiously attached people in any way, shape or form. But that 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 is the problem with anxious attachment is it boils up like that. So the goal is actually to learn to measure out those desires and needs and to have weekly meetings where you can say, here's a concern I'm having. Um, can we figure out together how to how to meet this in a way that's fair for both sides? And then he could say, yeah, uh, here's an idea. Could we do this? And you might say, is that okay? I'm, I just, I don't want to, I don't want to inconvenience. And he's going to say, well, if it's a need, it's a need. And you'll say, okay, is what can we, what need do you have that we can also meet, right? Because anxious people are like, well, I'm not, I'm not worthy. So let me do something for you. And he'll be like, well, you know, I have this challenge right here. Could you take care of this for me? Yeah, I can. Then you take care of each other. You reciprocate care for each other in that way. That's a great way to handle it right there. What do you think about that, Allison? Could you do check-ins like that and handle problems instead of waiting for them, for them to blow up? 
I wish my avoidant would have done that. I walked on eggshells with my avoidant for 10 years. I'd speak up. He would say he would do it. He would do it for a bit. Then he wouldn't sustain it. And that, Francis, is a massive problem. That's why I wrote right over my shoulder, exhausted wives, bewildered husbands. Um, always check for the three-week test versus the four-week test. At the three-week test, a man who is not authentically changed and doesn't see the pattern and see, see the problem, he will fake the change for the first week. And then they're like, oh, I mean, it's going to be great. It'll be wonderful. The second week is, look how good I'm doing. 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 Aren't you happy? Third week is going back down and then saying, well, how long do, you, do I have to do this? How long will you hold this against me? How long? And then back to quiet and then and then goes back. By the four-week test is growing. I'm going to do this. This feels so great. Second week is this feels really good. I want to share it with you. Third week is like, this is incredible. And I'm diving in. I'm learning new and making new connections with other people. Fourth week is like, they're taking off with the new change and have a whole new behavioral pattern. That's the difference. That's the difference you need to be looking for. He's extremely avoidant. So getting him to open up is tough, usually very short. Yeah. So that's Allison. When I, when I have coaching clients come into me and I have a couple come into me for this and they talk with me and say, Adam, you know, uh, we, we have these fights, there's blow ups. It doesn't feel right. And the guy's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know how long I can keep doing this. It's exhausting. Her feelings are my problem and I hate it. And I say, look, what if we institute a system where everything is going to be fair and measurable and we're going to take care of problems reasonably right up front when they're small the risks will be managed. Everything will be handled very, very simply. He's like, yes. And she's like, how do we do that? And I say, we institute weekly check-ins where you have very solu short and solution-focused non-feelings meetings where you check in for about 10 minutes every Thursday, every Saturday, and you're going to structure it exactly this way, this way, and this way, have this conversation, address this issue, get it done, problem solved. And he's like, well, I don't know. It sounds like it could turn into a bunch of feelings. And I'm like, no, it won't. Here's why. Boom, boom, boom. And she says, well, I'd feel bad like dumping all these problems on him every week. And I'm like, well, do you feel worse blowing up at him every three months? Or do you think that that's sustainable? Do you think that once a week, short little pieces that you guys can solve together might be sustainable? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, great. And I implement it. And then they check in with me next week. Usually they're like, it actually went well. And then like three weeks, four weeks, they, they're doing great. And then they solve all these problems. But then they also build emotional intimacy and trust as they're building the cycle together like this. So super important, Allison, that you guys be able to implement that. If you can't, schedule a coaching session with me. I will show you guys personally myself exactly how to do that. And it's not couples therapy. It is solution-focused relationship building. Think of it that way. Pitch it to him that way. I build systems. I don't, I don't do therapy and I don't talk about feelings. I build you systems that make relationships sustainable. That is what I do. So there you go. My husband is traumatized by long emotional conversations. Yeah, it's it's awful to do that when you guys don't have a structure. And a lot of couples try. And it's not like you guys are doing it on purpose. But a, a lot of couples try that. And there's so, it's so much exhaustion and so much draining and so much frustration. And then they get super gun shy about ever talking about feelings again. And it's a horrible experience. Being with the avoidant actually has helped me see how they can be painted as narcissists, but it's revealed to me how much the clear direct I can be. Exactly. Some of them do have narcissistic traits. Now, here's the kicker. Here's the big kicker, you guys. Pushing back on manipulative behaviors requires you to be clear and direct in your communication. It requires you to know your principles. It requires you to know your long-term goals. It requires you to focus on, so, on building those as important pieces of your life, more important than pleasing other people, okay? Hugely important that you do this. Now, this is part of fixing your attachment. That's why in my attachment boot camp video course that shows you how to fix anxious attachment, it walks you through exactly how to find your principles, find your long-term goals, start living to them, start building those boundaries. That's why it's like the first lessons in the, in the course. But you have to be able to live to those pieces so that you can then talk to other people about them. And that's the other key. You have to be able to talk to other people about your principles and goals without like being petrified that they're going to reject you for it. Okay. Diane, thank you so much for becoming a member. I really appreciate that. Support the channel. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much. If you have questions, pop them in. Remember that at the end of this, I'm going to have a members only chat as well. You can hit me with all the questions you have in that section. I'll be there. Um, 
pushing back on manipulation. If you start manipulation tactics, you get down in the mud with them and they will win. They will win. And at the worst, even if you win, you have become a manipulative person. And that is not really winning. The bet only way to win a fight with a manipulator is to be clear and direct and use your boundaries as they connect to your long-term goals and your values. Okay? Mandatory that you do this. Know thyself, right? Know thyself first and then be able to articulate this. I will say this. Ethically avoidant people, when you can articulate to them what is wrong and why, and that it's a sense of right and wrong or a long-term goal, that is measurable. They are not usually ones to push at that point and say, come on, just break it anyway. Just do it. What's the big deal? Come on, don't be a prude, right? They'll say, you know what? That actually makes sense. I get what it's like when nobody's fair with you. Uh, I, I don't want to do that to you either. So let's find a way around this. Cool. Let's talk, talk about the actual need. Here's the actual need. Okay, well, what if we do this instead? This would be a great way to do that. Yeah, that works. As you do that, you actually release the hormone vasopressin, which bonds you by solving problems together. It also releases oxytocin because you're accepting of each other and giving love to each other. Super important, you guys. Multiple bonding hormones release when you do this process. So it is not just good to do this. It is mandatory. How do you set boundaries with individuals with PTSD? Uh, they need to go get help for the PTSD so that their post-traumatic stress disorder issues are not making them irrational in relationships. It's going to be really hard for you to regulate their feelings for them. You, you really can't. You really can't. They're not, And they're not your child, typically. So they need to go get help and regulate their own emotions first so that they can then be functional in relationships if it's that level of PTSD. Make sense? Otherwise, you can set boundaries with individuals who have PTSD exactly like I've laid out right here. Exactly like I've laid out right here. That's it. Uh, one more piece on the talk up topic of boundaries against manipulation. If at any point you feel that the other person is being manipulative, you can literally say, it really feels manipulative what you're doing here. And I really need you to support me and care about me. You can literally say that. Now, to Dozer's piece about gaslighting earlier, right? People who push back on you. You don't feel that. You're just being evil. You're just controlling me by having thoughts of your own. Get a spotter outside the relationship. This is not about triangulating. Don't go outside and say, so and so told me. No. But get a spotter, someone you respect, a mentor of some kind, right? I have the attachment circle community. People come to me for this all the time. A therapist, a, a priest or a pastor, uh, a trusted elder of some kind. Get somebody who is wise in those capacities and can see pieces of relationships that you miss. And then talk with them and say, can I get your insight on something? Do you feel that this is appropriate response? Do you feel that this is something that they're doing? Do you feel that this is, you know, do you feel that this is a good relationship or that they're acting in good faith? Okay. Yes. Get an atom. That's what I have the, the attachment circle for or my coaching practice. That's what I have these pieces for you guys is exactly to give that spotting, that professional spotting like this, but get somebody involved so that you can ask them, look, is this reasonable? Because gaslighting, it really only works when there's two people involved, when there's a third person, a third party to observe much harder for gaslighting to be effective. Okay, just make sure you get an objective person, not a person who's also going to manipulate you. You don't want to be balanced between two two manipulators. I've seen people do that before, right? Like, I'm going to go tell my mom, and she's horrifically manipulative. Don't do that. Mom is probably not a good option, typically, for any of this. Just going to be honest with you. You need somebody else, usually, to help you be an objective spotter. So do that, and then be willing to push back and say, this relationship does not feel right to me. This relationship does not feel right. There's a lot of pain and a lot of fear here, and we need to build that and, and fix that. And a person who cares about you will say, I don't want you to feel that. Maybe I don't understand what you're experiencing or what you're saying. I want to understand. Can you please make this measurable for me? Right? Totally fine for them to have that reaction. That's okay. I don't understand. Can you please help me to understand? Cool. And then when they do start understanding, do they take steps to help you fix it? That's the response you should be looking for. An attempt to understand. 
questions, curiosity, right? Trying to build a solution. If they instantly jump into shutting you down, not cool. I have all the time, I have um, a lot of people who have avoidant partners. They pop into just a single coaching session with me and they say, Adam, I'm just going to sign up on a single session. I just want to talk with you, lay out everything in my relationship, and you tell me if it's fixable or not. Give me a final definitive answer on if this is fixable. And I ask them a million questions. And I ask them about their attachment, the other person's behaviors, the relationship dynamics. And I say, try this and try this. And if you get this response, not fixable. If you get this response, probably fixable. Then test this, and then that will tell you if it is fixable or not. Do this and this, or do this and this. Give this a try. This is the answer. If you don't have that layer of certainty, sign up with me. I'll teach you. But you need to build a plan to test that person to see if they're willing to work with you. There's there's plenty of cases where I've had people come in and say, I think my partner is manipulative or narcissistic. And it really turns out the person's not narcissistic or manipulative. Yes, they're avoidant um, and they're defensive, but they're really trying to understand and they're really frustrated. And it's a bad mismatch of communication. I've seen that so many times, right? The perception of manipulation or some manipulation being used, but as a defensive tactic, not for exploitation, but because they don't know how to do otherwise. I've seen that plenty of too, plenty, plenty of times. Allison, how would I go about booking a session? Uh, my website, adamlanesmith.com is a great resource. adamlanesmith.com, consultations, single session. Or uh, just send me an email, support at adamlanesmith.com. You guys can send me questions. Adam, I need some help fixing my anxious attachment. What do I do? Cool. Try this, right? Here's a, here's a resource that will help. Uh, Adam, my partner and I need help building a loving romantic situation. We need premarital coaching. Adam, we are fighting all the time. We need to fix. Okay, marriage. I have my marriage rescue package. Adam, my life is a disaster. Fix me. Cool. I have the life overhaul package. Adam, I need your mentorship community. Okay, here's the attachment circle. Send me an email. I'll talk with you about resources. If you need a video, a book, whatever it is, talk talk with me. Support at adamlanesmith.com. Send me an email. I'm here to help. All right, you guys, that is what you do with manipulative partners or manipulative anybody. Do not manipulate. Assert your boundaries. Assert your goals. Assert your principles. Talk to them about how it does not feel right. Get Tell them this is not sustainable. I want a sustainable relationship and get supportive help on the outside, but from somebody who's going to be objective and not have their own uh, manipulative tendencies as well. Very important that you be able to do that. I am turning on members only chat right now. Uh, Emma, Adam's biochemistry video really helped me as a secure person. I understand why they communicate in unhealthy ways or not enough. Thank you, Emma. That's fantastic. I love to hear that. What about the gray rock method? Those are, I, I've heard the gray rock method and it can be helpful if you are forced to be in proximity with those people right? And, and your life and you cannot ever get away from them ever. But to be honest with you, if you have any options whatsoever, why spend more time and energy on them even bothering with the gray rock method? You apply those boundaries and just tell them this is how it needs to be. That's my approach. I think the gray rock method, again, if, if, if it's your dad and you're forced to live with them, right? Or if it's your, your partner and you cannot get away from them in any way, shape or form kind of thing, and you've given up on the relationship completely, you can do that. But honestly, pushing back a bit with those boundaries, I've seen it save plenty of good relationships. Very rarely is it completely unfixable because the other person is a bad person. Very rarely is that the case. It happens, but very rarely is that the case. That's why I wrote my book. There it is. Exhausted Wives, Bewildered Husbands. That's why I wrote that book, was if your relationship is fixable, Here's how you can tell. If it's not fixable, here's how you can tell. But what trauma bonding, though? What? But what trauma bonding, though? Trauma bonding is when they inflict great pain and harm on you. You scurry around trying to make them feel better. Then they lavishly reward you for making them feel better. And then when they, when you do something they don't like, they inflict pain and fear on you again. So you scurry around and then frantically try to solve it. Then they lavishly reward you for solving their pain. So then you get constantly rewarded for uh, stopping hurting or stopping bothering them. And it's pain or love, pain or love. That's the trauma bond piece. Those are, that is overwhelmingly manipulative. And that usually is more of like a personality disorder tactic is usually what that is. It's members only chat right now. Keep the questions coming. Members, 
you support me and there are so many of you in this channel right now. What questions do you have? This is what we call micro coaching. Let me help you here tonight. Give me some questions. Give me some problems. Let me solve them in real time right now. What have you got for me? I'm here to help. And if you want to join the channel, hit join right now. Pop in, support the channel. This is your time to ask me questions. What have you got for me? But those victims still stay without having tools like Greyrock. They can. My contention is why do they stay? Why bother staying? You know what? I'm going to get just enough better to become emotionally numb against this person, but not get better enough to actually resolve the issue or get away from this harmful person. That's my contention with the gray rock thing, to be honest with you. Like I said, it, it's, it, it's a good tool to use when it is absolutely not possible to get away. And there's those circumstances, but it seems like half of a fix to me. Typically, does that make? Yeah. Okay. You got it. That, that's, that's the problem with me with the gray rock method. That's like, I'm going to give up halfway and just live like this for the next 20 years. I think there's ways to manage it better than that. Almost always. What questions do you guys have for me? Avoidance can oxytocin, vasopronic bond slowly over time. Absolutely. So let me tell you about some good coaching client stories. Uh, private details completely stripped out for confidentiality. Um, I had a couple come in where the man was, the anxious term would be afraid of commitment, but the avoidant term would be risk focused and aware of the risks of marriage, right? Totally different language on, on each side. Um, he was very aware of the risks of marriage and very concerned that he couldn't track their compatibility appropriately. Very concerned that their conflicts didn't appear to resolve very reasonably. Very concerned that her emotions appeared to be escalating and her resentment appeared to be getting out of control and then feared that they were fully incompatible and that marriage would be a disaster. She felt emotionally abandoned and she felt like she was being further dismissed and that the more she tried to connect with him, the more that he pushed back and the more that he dismissed their, their love and their connection. So uh, as we, uh, as we worked together, I'll tell you what happened. Thank you so much, Shannon, for popping in and supporting the channel. I appreciate you. And thank you so much. Make sure you drop your questions over there in the chat. Hit me with what you've got. Tonight is your night, so let me know. I'll also be here tomorrow night, you guys. You know, every Tuesday and every Wednesday at 7 p.m. I do these live streams. So beautiful. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys, all of you. Shannon, hit me with your questions. Um, what, what I did with this couple was sit them down and give her the framework to explain her emotions in a rational, measurable way about why it was important. I then translated and articulated for him why emotional intimacy was so crucial and why she was having those feelings and why it was increasing risks for him. Then I built in compatibility testing for them with the four levels of trust and showed them how they were actually a very compatible and then how they could resolve their fights and their dis disagreements very quickly. And then as they started using it, what was cool was his cortisol came way down. That's the problem with avoidant people. <gasps> excuse me, is, is their, their cortisol is so high, it blocks the reception of any oxytocin they could get. So they don't generate much oxytocin and they don't enter the situations where they would get much of it either. So as he relaxed, his cortisol came way down and he was able to relax into her presence, have conversations with her, be heard, be accepted, not be afraid of risk. And then they could warm up to each other and feel really loved he started releasing a lot of oxytocin. He started releasing a lot of vasopressin first, I would say, because they started resolving problems very quickly. When a woman helps an avoidant man reduce risks and builds those systems and says, I will reduce your risk for you, he's like mind blown. It makes his life so much easier. So that really is that answer. So yes, he started visibly, I could see the signs of oxytocin, vasopressin bonding, and so should, could she. And he started feeling weird. He was like, what is this weird feeling? And we talked him through like, this is what love feels like. This is why you feel vulnerable. It's okay. Here's how it's going to track. Here's what it's going to be like. Here's the experience. And they they ended up getting married, which was wonderful. And they were very happily married. I, I think he was happier on their wedding day even than she was. So guys, this can this can become beautiful. Just letting you know. I met a guy, I turned him to your channel, but he has severe military PTSD I have and avoidant due to the boundaries I've set. I totally hear you. Totally hear you. A lot of guys with severe, severe military PTSD, they actually start off with attachment challenges. Um, it is very, very hard to reach somebody who doesn't want to be reached. And if somebody is not able to regulate their emotions at all, and they are completely consumed 
by that trauma response, that is usually the number one place to start fixing it. Um, you dozer, you may want to point him into the resource called EMDR, Eye Movement Desensitization Reprogramming. It's one of the most effective non-talk therapy solutions for uh, for trauma. Uh, it's very effective, and men especially really like it because it's not talking about your feelings. It is doing a brain uh, behavior, basically, that, that reprograms away from the trauma. Give that a try, EMDR. Talk to him about that. That may be an option. If he resists that, there's probably not much you can do. Can't save everybody, unfortunately. I wish that we could. It's the hardest part of this job. Great questions so far, you guys. What else you got for me? Shannon, you popped in. I know you've got a good question, don't you? Or maybe you're just really happy to be here. That might be it too. So thank you. I appreciate you. Diane, you popped in as well. Do either one of you have questions? The other members who are here, thank you so much. What do you got for me? Hawk, you got anything? You usually have some pretty good insights on these. I know you're listening. Any other questions, you guys? I love these questions. I love these opportunities to give back like this. You guys support me, so I love being able to support you with these questions in return. As an anxious person, I feel like I'm a beacon of light to avoidance. It's been a constant theme in my life. I just didn't know, and I just turned 50. You're a beacon of light, um, like pulling them in like a like moths to a flame, or uh, that they find you and then kind of circle around you doing avoidant behaviors. What are we talking about there, Francis? Let me know. I'll help. If it's something tough, troubling, I'll help. <laughs> Not tonight, just absorbing your knowledge. That's cool. I appreciate that. I love sharing these times with you guys like this. This is cool. I love these conversations. You are a very chill and very cool community. You know, I know a lot of YouTube communities are like super hardcore, negative trolls in the chat. You guys are always super chill, so I love it. I cannot distinguish between excuses or true issues since I'm very tough love. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Think about this, Dodo. Um, very important distinction that was given to me in school, back in my graduate program. It's it's nine years to become a licensed psychotherapist. So during that program, during all that training, uh, I'll never forget what the head, the head of corrections at one of the facilities I I trained at. Um, she told me enabling is when you work harder than the person you're trying to help. So if the excuses is them not working and you making them making you work harder than them, that's usually an excuse. If the thing that they share is a frustration they're having, but they are continuing to work diligently in spite of that frustration, that is a pretty clear indicator that it's real. Does that make sense? Are they continuing to work or is it an excuse to give up while you continue working harder than they are? Shannon, there you are. There you are. I'm in the hot and cold cycle with my partner, whom I believe is DA. He's currently withdrawing since Sunday. What can I say to him initially to calm him down and bring him back into communication? Great question, Shannon. Um, tell me a little bit more. How long have you guys been together? And does he withdraw like this often? I would love to know that. Just get some get some framework around you guys. Dozer, he, very much he's working on it. That's fantastic. That that tells you it's probably not an issue. It's probably not an excuse. It actually is a true issue. Um, and trauma is is very, very much a real problem that can really impact things. He's going to need to resolve that, though, so that he can actually build uh, predictable and reliable responses so that you guys can both relax into the connection. Again, check out EMDR. I would very much check out EMDR, uh, the VA usually can can help him with v with emdr i believe it's it's covered under their services it's like the most effective treatment for ptsd so get connected there and you should be able to make that connection happen get connected there and you should be able to make that connection happen get connected there and you should be able to make that treatment option happen if it is appropriate for him check in with a provider <laughs> there we go shannon again um you're probably typing it out right now but how long have you been together and and does he withdraw often it's a new relationship. I've known him three to four years. That's cool. You have a lot of data on him then. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right. Remember, other people out here, if you hit that join, there it is, join button. You can pop in. You can become a member, and you can ask your questions. I'm here to help. Emma, he shares more and more over time. and seems to get more comfortable with me, but we're in a situation. Ooh, I have to check with myself plenty with the fears he actually isn't interested. Emma, I would sit down with him and say, <clears throat> look, 
I would like to have a deeper relationship with you. Are you interested in that? And if so, what would you need to see for us to move forward into that? If you can't do that, probably not a good sign. Wandering Wolf, thank you so much. I appreciate that donation. That is very, very kind. We're going to PTSD, PTSI, yep. Look at a new book called The Invisible Machine, Dr. Eugene Lipov. Like, huh? Okay. And Jamie Muster, PTSD is a physical injury. I understand what you're saying. I understand. Um, through all my training and experience, all 15 years and everything involved in all of this, and my my own expertise previously as, as a trauma specialist as well as attachment specialist back in the day, um, and all of the extensive trauma specialists I worked with throughout my many, many, many clinical years of, of clinical experience. Um, EMDR was the most effective treatment any of us had ever found. So I would very, very much recommend looking into that. But there's also other resources. Definitely gather as much information as you can. Shannon, I've never dealt with an avoidant before, just narcissistic behavior. I want to reassure him he's safe with me, get out of the relationship. Um, here's what I would recommend then, Shannon. Um, the right language to use with an avoidant person who is going to work with you and be respectful and responsible is to simply reach out to him and say, hi, I really want to be fair to you and I want to understand how to help both of us meet our needs and build a sustainable relationship. I would love to have a reasonable conversation with you when you're ready. Can you just let me know when you are going to be ready for this so that we can schedule it in? Now, if he is incapable of giving you a schedule, if he refuses, if that language doesn't even reach him, I would say he probably is not operating in good faith and he is acting on feelings and he is simply not considering you an actual relationship partner. He is very much just prioritizing his own feelings over you. Does that make sense? So that's what I would recommend is doing that. Good question. If you have more, let me know. Diane, my boyfriend. There you are. My boyfriend was considering making a commitment, but now said he's not ready. He says he's falling in love with me one week and now says he doesn't feel the same as I do. He is PTSD and is avoidant. <clears throat> Dan, how long have you been together? Please share that with me. And I ask specifically because avoidant attachment operates on a very specific timeline. That's why I ask that, you guys. It operates specific months, mean different things, length of time, one year, seven months, four months. There are specific markers when you are with an avoidant partner where certain things begin to wear off. For example, at seven months, the novelty dopamine of a new relationship is gone and they begin falling out of love with you at that point. Regan, thank you so much for supporting the channel and for becoming a member. I appreciate you. Make sure you drop your questions down there and let me know. Friends for 44 years, eight months dating. Okay, eight months. That is the right time for them to lose their dopamine bonding. And they have not shifted into long-term oxytocin bonding. They usually don't have um, access to the oxytocin bonding pathways because their cortisol is so high. They've never really experienced oxytocin bonding before. And that's what they need to be shifting into to be in love with you. So often at that point, they're experiencing doubt, fear. They don't know what to do. They feel like they're, they are never going to feel passion again, tremendously overwhelming feelings for them. And they're trying to be fair, uh, what to do. Um, they need to learn about avoidant attachment realistically, if they want to change that. Um, usually the best move actually, Diane, is to watch on my channel. Um, it's, it's a video called what men with avoidant attachment style need to be happy. Watch that video. There's a thumbnail that says, help him be, help him feel fulfilled. I would sit and watch that with him and say, would this make you feel happy? Would this really make you feel loved? I would sit and watch that with him. Okay. That's what I would do. Start that conversation. Can you do that? Dozer, I got to log off. Love your work. Thank you so much, Dozer. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the support. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, did I miss anybody? Okay, Diane says, okay. I, I would watch, watch the video yourself. It is super, super, super kind, loving, and compassionate with avoidant people. Um, it explains avoidant attachment, explains biochemistry, it explains everything. And then it walks them through what it would be like to be in a relationship. Okay, you have, perfect. I would sit and watch it with him and say, I want to show you this video. 
I think it will make you feel loved. And I want to learn about what will help you to feel loved. Can we watch this together? And then just at the end of it, you just tell me, would this help you to feel loved? Would you like to build this together? He agreed to watch it. Perfect. Love it. Love it. That's it. Watch that video with him. Okay. Now, if he watches the video and loves it and says, yes, I want this, then you have an attachment specialist right here in front of you that can show you guys how to build it. Whether that's my private mentorship, whether it's private coaching, whether it's a course, I have all kinds of stuff to help you. I am, guys, keep in mind, building a course right now for how to love an avoidant man, how to build an authentic, loving, fulfilling relationship with an avoidant man where he feels loved and cared for and you feel loved and cared for. I'm actually uh, finishing the script. I'll be filming it a week from this Saturday. My team will be editing it and building it out. It'll have all kinds of cool resources inside of it, and it will show you exactly what you're trying to build there. So is it bad if he watches it by himself? No, that's awesome. That's awesome because that actually means that he's interested in doing it. Did, did, your, uh, did your person watch it? He said he would watch it. As long as he watches it, cool. Fantastic. Watch it. It's great to watch it together if possible, because then you can have a conversation about it. But if he goes and watches it after you've watched it and then you have a conversation and he doesn't want you staring at him like this, staring at him sideways while you're trying, while he's trying to watch it. If he wants to watch it by himself, totally cool too. Just as long as he actually watches it. Right. As long as he's not in the other room watching hockey and pretending that he's watching it. Reagan, there you are. I believe my boyfriend is an avoidant. I've sent him your videos and he thinks he is too. Ooh. He says he'll reach out and get help, but I don't want to push him. We've been together for one year, off and on. All this started a month. Got it. Yep. Okay. Um, makes sense. I am here to help, number one. Most avoidant guys have to circle me for like six months to see if I'm like totally fake and going to scam them out of money, usually is what they do. And then they'll make initial contact with me and barely speak to me a little bit and then like run away for a month or two and then come back and apologize for having run away and then kind of talk to me and then go away for another month and then come back and kind of talk to me. And then they're willing to like, you know, do coaching with me or something like that or my private mentorship community, the attachment circle. That's usually what they do kind of that back and forth. So totally cool. Totally cool if he has to kind of do the dance with me for a little while. That's fine, too. He says he loves me and wants to be with me long term. I have two kids from a previous marriage. It scares him. I wonder if I should give up or if there's hope for a relationship. Yeah, I, I was working with a woman um, not that long ago. because a lot of women come in for this. Exactly. And she said, I think he's avoidant, but he's not bad. He actually is willing to work on it. He doesn't know how to relate to my kids. And I'm not sure if this is a compatibility match or not. How do I know? So I said, okay. Let's talk about what you're looking for, long-term family. What, what role do you want him to play in that family? What family do you want to build together as a couple? What family do you want for your kids? Okay, he needs to take these steps, but you need to give him that permission to have relationships with your kids. Then he needs to be building individual relationships with those kids. But he needs to go to them and ask them, what role would you like me to play in your life as, you know, as, as the stepdad? In essence, what do you want me to be to you? And then the kids can build that with them. They can build their relationship together. And by them doing that, that actually fosters a relationship with you because he's showing you that he's investing in the people you care about most. That is a crucial step to being able to build that. But it really is him building that relationship with the kids and allowing them to define the relationship they'd like to have with him. That's something that they can build. Barbie, I offered Zoom together. He likes to think and ponder things before he reacts. Totally cool. By all means, have him watch it. Tell him to watch it. Tell him to prepare a book report and uh, that you guys will, will talk about it later and then have a great conversation. That sounds fantastic. At least he's willing to do it. See, you guys, there's so many great avoidant men out there who are willing to do the work and want to learn. There's probably a ton of them silently lurking. Hi, guys. Right now in the chat, like just watching. They're in there like five months, six months with me watching to see if I'm going to attack them and steal their wallet. And it's totally cool. I get it. Um, but they're they're watching. They're learning. They're growing. Do you have any idea how many avoidant men message me daily in, in Instagram, in Twitter, in Facebook, uh, in emails? Like, Adam, I have avoidant attachment style. What am I supposed to do about this? Like, I am actually wanting to fix this and find authentic love. I get that all the time, you guys. So there's a tremendous amount of wonderful avoidant men out there who are wanting to change. Everybody in chat right now, you guys are all talking about your mostly your avoidant partners over there who are wanting to build this. So shout out to the avoidant guys who are wanting to find real, authentic love. I have, um, oh my goodness, I just remembered. Um, this Thursday, 
You guys are going to like this. It's going to be rough. Um, this Thursday, my I Wish You New podcast, right? The I Wish You New podcast that I'm, I'm one of the hosts on there. My new co-host is an avoidant man. And the episode we're releasing this Thursday is a deep dive where he said, Adam, why the hell should I have to fix my avoidant behaviors? I'm not the problem. Everybody else is the problem. And it was about an hour of just ruthless back and forth about why an avoidant man who's high performing still should fix his avoidant attachment style if he wants to find long-term fulfillment in his life. That uh, that episode is dropping on Thursday. <laughs> I'm going to have clips to it over here. Uh, please do not miss that episode. Anybody who is avoidant or loves an avoidant or has argued with an avoidant before or has argued with yourself before, um, definitely don't miss that episode. It was probably one of the best episodes I have ever filmed in my life of any podcast. So that episode will be coming very, very soon. Francis, my avoidant and I were on and off for 10 years. He ghosted me for a year. Now we only chat on Facebook message. I thought when he didn't talk for a year, it was over. Like the feeling is never over with him. Yeah, most avoidant people, um, their understanding of relationships is based on the cortisol and dopamine pathways. So it is, are we giving each other cortisol? Let's back off. Are we giving each other dopamine? Let's pull in. And when you are giving him cortisol by acting like you have expectations, he'll back off. When you're just neutral and sitting there and he gives you dopamine, so you give him some back, he'll come back in. That's their understanding of relationships is cortisol and dopamine. They don't really have connection points yet in the oxytocin, serotonin, vasopressin, GABA pathways for the relationship. Valerie, good to see you. Welcome. Is this current? Is what current? That The episode for the podcast? Uh, it was filmed just not that long ago. Where do I find the podcast? Oh, uh, I wish you knew. I wish you knew. It's, it's the podcast called I Wish You Knew. I'm, on the, I'm one of the co-hosts from season one, now into season two. I have a new co-host for season two. Um, definitely check it out. I wish you knew. It, they've got a YouTube channel here. We've got it. We're on like every podcasting platform ever. So I wish you knew. If you go check it out on uh, here on YouTube, it'll drop on Thursday, that episode. It's it's going to blow some, blow some doors off some conversations. I'm just going to say it's going to be pretty intense. How does a man increase testosterone naturally? Uh, there are so many ways to do that. But, I mean, fixing your relationship approach and diminishing your cortisol and fear is a huge way of removing the things that are crushing your testosterone. Cortisol will really, over time, really diminish that testosterone effect. So building healthier relationships is a great way to start helping improve your testosterone just back to its natural levels even. I'm a night shift nurse. Oh, okay. Totally get you. Completely get you, Valerie. 100%. Um, I'm about to end this live stream, but I will be back tomorrow night at 7 p.m. U.S. Central Time. Same time slot we're just ending. So one hour earlier from the, from right where we are right now. I'll be back tomorrow night, you guys. Thank you, and members. Thank you to all my new members. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Remember to come back tomorrow. It will be more atta avoid an attachment. Um, to, I, so I ran a poll. And you guys were great on responding. Thank you so much. What topics you wanted to see? One was how to, this one, the biggest one was how to push back against manipulative behaviors from avoidant people. And tomorrow night will be how to fix avoidant attachment style. I'm going to talk about that with you tomorrow night, just in time for that Thursday episode release uh, of why should I have to fix my avoidant attachment style? That will be a huge conversation. 7 p.m. What time frame? Uh, U.S. Central time. Central time. So currently it is 8 p.m. Central Time, one hour before now. So 23 hours from now. Think of it that way. Thank you to everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Send me an email, Adam Lane, uh, uh, su support at adamlanesmith.com. Support at adamlanesmith.com. Send me an email if you need help. I am here to answer questions. I'm here to point you at resources. I'm here to help you fix your relationships. Let me know how I can help. And to all my avoidant people out there circling who are in their third month or their fifth month and haven't decided to speak to me yet, totally cool. I'll be here when you guys are ready to. Thank you, you guys. Talk to you tomorrow night.